will do. And then I'm going to switch to my hand view. And so I'll be asking you questions while I'm working with my hands. So if you just only see my hands and not my face, don't be alarmed. That's the way it's, it's supposed to go. <laughs> it's a very eccentric show. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the second episode of the live series, The Charitable Confectioner. I'm Linda Kachadurian and this series merges my passions of social causes and edible art. Um, during each episode, we will be taking on a new topic with the help of an expert in the field, while I craft a decorative edible piece that will serve as a physical representation. My hope is that by infusing a little bit of whimsy and creativity with the edible art, it will make the somber topics we are talking about a bit more palatable. So today's topic is a one I care very much about. It's the importance of education in developing nations. And my guest is Harut Nersesian, the country representative, the Armenian country representative for Armenian Missionary Association of America. Um, founded in 1920, AMAA is one of the world's oldest and largest Armenian focused nonprofits. And they do multiple programs ranging from education to healthcare to orphan care. They provide humanitarian aid in war torn regions such as Artsakh. But today we will be focusing solely on their educational programs. Over the past few years, I have had the privilege to be able to collaborate with them a little bit via my educational nonprofit called Charitable Confections, and it has been such a pleasure. So Harut, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me. I know it's the middle of the night in Yerevan, so I really appreciate that you are you have stayed awake for this. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay, great. So what we're going to do is before I start getting into the meaty questions for Harut, I am just going to quickly pull up an image of the edible art that I am going to be um, showing you today. So let's just pull this up. Okay, so what we are looking at um, is entitled Tree of Armenia backslash disputed. It is a sugar and potato starch paper sculpture. Uh, given that our April 24th is Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day, I thought it fitting to do both an episode as well as an art piece that focuses on Armenia this week. And the reason why it's called Tree of Armenia Disputed, the disputed in the title refers to the land that was once ours but no longer is, and the image of Mount Ararat, which is embedded in one of the leaves, I'm showing you a close-up of it now, um, is an iconic landmark that used to be part of Armenia. And because the episodes are only 27 minutes long, what I do is I make these pieces ahead of time. And then during the show, I merely demonstrate techniques used. And so today we will be learning a little bit of coloring and working with potato starch paper. We'll learn a little bit how to pour isomalt, which is the sugar, the type of sugar with which I work, and how to do uh, what I call edible decoupage. So if you can see this close up we're looking at, that's actually the base of the sculpture. And so sort of decoupage style or embedded in in that sugar base are uh, dried and crystallized leaves. And again, we saw that with the leaf, which has an edible uh, image of Mount Aura. So that is that. Um, so let us start. Let's get started with, let's move to this thing and we will get started with the questions. So Harut. The primary and secondary education in Armenia is free and compulsory, and the country has a literacy rate of 99.8%. So obviously something is being done properly. But in what areas do you think the public education system needs improvement? Uh, unfortunately, in the uh, post-Soviet era, since the independence of Armenia back in 1991, uh, many systems collapsed, including the educational system. Uh, corruption was introduced or came in, and the quality of instruction and education completely collapsed, went down. Just And uh, as a result, 
many, many, many students or most students were left with insufficient and improper education and instruction in schools. Okay. So those who had money could afford tutoring. Mm -hmm. Those who couldn't afford, they fell through the cracks. Right. Okay. And um, as I had mentioned in the introduction, AMAA works in many areas, um, but one of those areas is education. So how important are the educational projects and why? Because your organization has such a broad scope between the spiritual and the humanitarian aid and the orphan care and everything, but how important specifically are the educational projects? Education is important. It's critically important in any nation. Mm -hmm. And in developing nations, it's far more critical because if you want to develop democracy, you want an educated uh, young generation, right. you want a population that understands, that can yeah. think critically, you want an edge uh, if you want a strong economy, you need people uh, who are well trained who are professionals, who can make things happen. You need entrepreneurs, you need to nurture them, you need to motivate, teach. So education is the best gift you can give a child is good quality education. And I'm, I don't mean just academics. Uh, you need proper upbringing, you need proper value system, you need a proper mindset, critical thinking, creative thinking, you need to encourage these uh, non-academic educational elements. Uh, that's why, I mean, that's what makes a good citizen. That's what makes a productive citizen. Uh, that's why education is important. And holistic education is what I'm talking about, yeah. not just academics. Right. And that actually leads me to my next question about the Avetisian School, because I do know that you have uh, classes in moral character development and, and such um, really cool uh, life skills. So when I toured the Avetisian School, which is a primary and secondary school that was founded in Yerevan in 1998 by AMAA, I was so impressed by the sophistication of the facilities and the broad range of classes. Um, and so what was the planning process for the curriculum and what has changed since it first opened? I do know that you bravo, 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 received the LEED certification in 2019. And that makes me so happy. Uh, for anyone who does not know, um, it, LEED stands for Leadership, Energy and Environmental Design. And that is just a really big thing that in a developing nation, you have a school that um, is just green and energy. So um, if you could just talk a little bit about the planning process for the curriculum and, and how, what has changed. Okay. Uh, okay, the school started in 1998 uh, and uh, it was uh, established in a low income neighborhood of Yerevan, the capital. And the purpose was to give tuition free quality education to low income children. Uh, and our benefactor, uh, Ed and Pamela Avedisian, our benefactors, their vision was to help the low-income uh, families do well, have, have a brighter future, have hope for the future. Uh, it, we, we, it's a public, it's, it, it follows the public curriculum because uh, that's what's mandated by government. Mm -hmm. We cannot diverge from it, uh, but we enrich it. But more important, uh, I mean, the most critical element is to have good teachers. The critical factor in education is teacher. So we hire the best teachers, we pay them well, and we motivate, we train, we have ongoing training uh, programs for the teachers. But, and also, in addition to the academics, as I said, uh, we teach um, character, life skills, value systems, uh, so what happens is most of our students, all of the students, all of our graduates attend university. We have 100% university uh, attendance. In 2016, uh, we moved into uh, 2014, actually, we moved into a brand new building, which is outstanding. It's large, it's environmental, it's state of the art. Uh, we recycle water, uh, we get 
hot water from the sun. Uh, we have green roofs and focused environmental training. Uh, the kids engage in various environmental programs. Uh, it's, a, it's a green building, basically. The whole building is a lab. And that's why we obtained the LEED Silver Certification. The first one uh, in Armenia, the first LEED certificate building, certified building in Armenia. And actually the first silver in the region. That is just so impressive. Um, and it's just such a lovely school. Uh, it, it really is remarkable. You know, a couple of years ago, um, when I had a Harvard College intern uh, working for me, and she had done her uh, high school education in one of the poshest private schools here in the States called St. Paul. And I wanted her to have a look at videos and photos I had taken of Abhidisian school. And I told her, doesn't this just compare to the school you went to, which by the way, was, you know, even for day students is probably about 60,000 a year or something. And, and she was just very impressed and, and she couldn't believe it. Um, and as you had mentioned, the school is tuition free because AMAA does cover the cost of that. Now, last year, AMAA via Charitable Confections was presented with an opportunity to be part of a program run by Harvard Global and Research Consulting Group's Charity Collaboration Program. And I share the specifications that you and the Armenia office had come up with. Um, and it was for a new STEM and tech center to serve as an add-on to the Abedician School. And it was accepted, but unfortunately, things got suspended a short while before the pandemic hit. But since then, I know you've told me that you have been cooking up an even larger technological pro project for the school. So could you share some details about that and why you feel that also technology is something important? Okay. Uh, uh, high tech is critical in the 21st century and Armenia has a very a strong growing IT industry. And Ar Armenia is also very advanced uh, in agriculture and we want our students to take advantage of them. And we want to expose them. Many of these low income families are children. They, they don't know what opportunities are, are out there. So our plan now is to create three high tech labs one is for IT and robotics, the other one is for high-tech agriculture, and the other one is for renewable energy. And we want to expose the children to these industries, what they can do, what the possibilities are, what the opportunities are. And those who are interested, who have the skills, uh, we will give them the basic training so that later on they can move on and pursue careers in those areas. They can go to university, and pursue uh, education in those areas, specialize in engineering uh, or what have you. Because today there's a huge shortage of IT specialists in Armenia and there's a huge demand and they're very, very well paid. So these low income kids, they can have a chance at a very, very high paying good jobs if they have the interest and the skills. So we want to give the kids, and also I also want to mention that the school is a community center, and these labs will be open to uh, to the kids in the neighborhood. Okay, that sounds so wonderful. Um, in addition, so we've been focusing a lot on the Abedisian School, but AMAA also has several short day centers throughout Armenia. So can you tell us a little bit? about their mission and educational philosophy. Okay, the show centers are designed to help vulnerable children. And when I say vulnerable, I don't mean just low income. They are all low income, but also kids that come from broken families, problematic families, um, kids from domestic violent uh, families. Uh, and we have, uh, social workers, we have psychologists, we have professionals, we have teachers that work with these kids. Now, the aim of these centers, this is an after-school program. It's, uh, we call it the day center. It's an after-school program. And the kids come right after school. They have a hot meal. And then they go split into their classrooms where they get tutoring services. 
and uh, teachers help them with their homework assignments. They explain things that they don't understand. But more important, they work with the social workers and the psychologists to help them overcome the challenges that they have, emotional, psychological. Uh, many of the kids come, they don't know how to interact with other kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have programs, uh, group work, uh, individual work, to help them learn to relate to other people, to respect other people, um, to solve problems, uh, conflicts uh, constructively. And again, the purpose is to give them good education, but also good life skills so okay. that they can be successful in life. Uh, the, the, you know, poverty uh, is a chain. Uh, and it, it's, it passes from generation to generation. So we want to break that chain. Uh, and this, these centers, we have five of them. A sixth one is in the works. Uh, we want to help these, uh, these kids break out and have a bright future. Right. Um, and that is, is so impressive. Before I, we go a little bit further, I just want to give a quick update on what I have been doing with my hands during while you were answering all of these questions. So we did a couple of things. Um, I had said we would be working with potato starch paper. So I went ahead and I embedded an edible image of, I decided instead of doing Mount Ararat again, I did an edible image of Tatev Monastery. And that was embedded. Uh, I had heated up the isomalt syrup. I had cooked up the isomalt syrup ahead of time. And I just heated it up in the microwave and I poured it in here. And when this hardens a little bit, I'm going to remove it and just pull it to make a nice fluid leaf shape. And over here, I just coated um, an, a little isomalt pedestal with a bit of edible gold luster dust. I had a pre-made leaf and flower, and I was coloring with edible markers, the potato starch butterfly. And edible markers, it's, it's kind of tricky because they actually look identical to regular markers, other than the fact that edible is printed on them. And it basically, they're just markers with food coloring in them. So you can use those to color all sorts of different things. So that is what has been going down over here. Have you been, do you find this all very odd and confusing? <laughs> very interesting, <laughs> to be honest, and appetizing. Uh, well, I don't know. Actually, isomalt isn't the most appetizing thing. I purposely, I know you're a chocolate fiend, and I purposely did not do a piece of art with chocolate this time because I did not want to torture you. And yes, just, thank you. <laughs> I mean, flying over on your end. You're always like, no, you're tormenting me. Um, but I just want to tell people, for all my fellow science geeks out there, I work with a sugar called isomalt. And what isomalt is, it's a naturally derived sugar from sugar beets. Uh, chemists isolate sucrose. What we think of when we think of sugar for baking white granulated sugar, the scientific term is sucrose. And so chemists take the sucrose from sugar beets and transform it into a compound disaccharide. And so the formula is glucose and mannitol disaccharide plus glucose and sorbitol uh, disaccharide. And what all of that means, just in really simple terms, is that uh, these will not attract as much moisture as regular sugar as sucrose, which will make the pieces more translucent and glass-like and last for many, many years. So that is my update from over here. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the scope of your Armenian projects, because you have, uh, AMAA has 24 Armenian schools around the world. So can you tell us um, some of the countries, other countries you work in? I was surprised to see Turkey on the list, but that was named after Hrun Inc., the, uh, the slain uh, journalist. But if you could tell us a little bit about some of those other countries. Okay, let me mention the one in Turkey. Um, uh, this is for children from illegal residents, Armenian residents in Turkey. You know, after the uh, independence, many are, I mean, there was huge widespread, widespread poverty in Armenia. And so many Armenians emigrated to various countries to earn some income. <clears throat> and among them, many Armenians went to Turkey. Mm -hmm. So, but they're illegal there and their children cannot attend school. Wow. So uh, our church there, the Armenian Evangelical Church of Gedik Pasha in Istanbul, mm -hmm. uh, 
they opened the school in the basement. It's oh, a okay. tuition-free school. Okay. And kids from these families come and they're, they're educated basically uh, because otherwise they will be left out on, on the streets. Uh, they won't be able to attend school. Yeah. But that's one example that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But most of our schools are in the Middle East, mm -hmm. Lebanon, Syria, mm -hmm. uh, now Armenia. We have kindergartens in Armenia and Artsakh. In addition, in addition, we have uh, schools in North America. Um, th that's basically it. Uh, you know, after the genocide mm -hmm. uh, at the turn of the century, of the 20th century, Armenians, many, many, many Armenians emigrated, uh, moved. They were deported and they ended up in the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, that whole area. Yes. Uh, and Armenian evangelicals open churches and always schools next to the churches and AMA was there to support them. Mm -hmm. And to date we support and I, I can tell you our schools are some of the best because evangelicals believe in education. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, evangelical, the Protestant movement in Europe started with strong focus on education. Uh, Martin Luther and other reformers, they said, People have to read the Bible, but right. people couldn't read. So they opened schools to teach them to read so that they could read the Bible. And that gave them an edge. Uh, and you can see that in North America, you can see that in Northern Europe, they have an edge. Uh, and that's the, you know, people can debate this, historians, of course. But so evangelicals, uh, even before the genocide, uh, evangelicals in uh, the Ottoman Empire, we had over 240 schools. Mm -hmm. And the first high school for girls was opened by evangelicals uh, because we believe in equality of education. Uh, and again, education is critically important to have good people, to have democracy, to have a healthy society. Right. And one of the things that I think bears mentioning is that although obviously AMAA is very faith-based, as you said, um, in evangelical beliefs, it is very inclusive. It does not discriminate against people of any faith or religion. And I think that's very important because I think sometimes when people see missionary, you know, folded into the title of a nonprofit, some people get a little bit scared or turned off, but AMA is not like that at all. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, in Armenia, our services are open to everybody, mm -hmm. everybody. We don't even know who, what religious really background. We don't really care. Uh, we are Christian. We, mm -hmm. We're driven by Christian values uh, and uh, we are there to help, to help everybody. And that's what Christ did. He helped everybody regardless mm -hmm. uh, of their religious background or religious interests. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are there to lift up uh, the forgotten, the ignored, the marginalized. Yes. And you also spread a message that is hopeful and kind of not confrontational. Um, I, I wanted to keep this episode specifically about education, but of course, for anyone who's been following the news, there was for a few months um, the war in Artsakh, and I know that took a toll on many of the young students. In fact, one of them whom I was, who had been volunteering for me, um, had actually dropped out of university to help with the war effort. So it, it is nice just to have an organization that does provide help and guidance and, and kind of makes people feel as though, you know what, we're all going to get through this. And at the end of the day, everything will eventually be okay. So I think that's just important to maintain a positive, uh, just to maintain a positive message in, in these dark times. So uh, just a quick update on what was going on over here. As you can see, this is the leaf that has the potato starch image embedded in it. And what I like to do when I cast the sugar leaves, because leaves aren't completely flat, I like to pull them a little bit to give them undulation and shape. And because um, if you just leave the leaf after you've pulled it alone, it will just collapse back to its original shape. I get a little piece of tin foil or some such thing just to prop it up until it is fully hardened. And so we are running out of time, but basically you can see that this is 
um, something like just a little miniature version of what I had made with the big sculpture. Um, and Taro, you don't have to feel bad because as I said, isomalt really has very little flavor. It is edible, but um, it's not that tasty. So I think that we are coming to the end of the show. I know it was so short, only 27 minutes, but um, I would like to just wrap up quickly um, and tell everybody that they are welcome to tune in every first and third Tuesday on this channel at this time slot for new episodes of The Charitable Confectioner. And I am so grateful to everyone who tuned in and my stellar guest, Harut. Uh, thank you so much for staying awake. And I will leave everybody today with a piece of music uh, called Masquerade Waltz by the 20th century iconic Armenian composer, Aram Kachadurian, who unfortunately is not a relation. So enjoy and bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.